Okay, let's continue on. We're now in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, where John says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he, the angel, said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him the glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So uh, this angel, uh, what we're seeing here is basically, we could call it an official notice, announcing that while the end of time and God's full wrath on mankind is now imminent, there's still hope. And that's the heart of God. Uh as uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. One thing we can say for certain, there's a lot that's already happened now um, with uh, the seals and the trumpets, and the church, I'm sure, is just totally re-energized in spreading the gospel um, and then also, there's, I would say there's a possibility that angels or an angel will help um, at the very end or before the very end. Let's read on. Verse 8, another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Wow, where did this come from? Well, it's Remember, this is a parenthetical, right? So we've got some explanation of what's happened, what's history, what's going going, and what's going to be a preview of the future, which is, here's an example. Because this is the first mention in Revelation of Babylon the Great. And in chapter 16 through 18, her definition and destruction from God's seventh and last bowl of his wrath will be documented. Uh, here's a little preview, Revelation 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Hmm, that sounds very familiar to what was said on the cross before Jesus gave up his breath. His first mission it is finished. Now the second mission, it is done. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath, which we will read in Revelation. Verse 9, now we got another angel, a third that followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy ones and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast in its image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So this is a very severe warning. One thing we can say if people hear this and they have not taken the, the mark of the beast, uh, it's not because they have not been forewarned. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. And that is we're just passing through. We all move on we all pass and we will go home and i hope and pray that that home for all of us will be god's coming kingdom compare this though with isaiah 66 24 and once again this just leaves no wiggle room concerning the after uh, of what happens in hell now 66 24 in isaiah concerning concerns the aftermath of the battle of armageddon where, quote, they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, me being the Lord. 
for their worm shall not die. Their fire shall not be quenched. And they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Or as it says here in Revelation, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. So this is further scriptural proof on the reality of hell and also stands as a warning today uh, to the spiritual choice that we all have to make, not just the end time generation. Uh, but we are being told in very clear terms, whatever you do, whatever it takes, even if it means dying as a martyr, do not worship the Antichrist. Do not take his mark, no matter what. Okay, now, uh, John, uh, here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So what we're referring to here specifically are Christian saints because it's Christians that put their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Then we hear, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So, once again, we got a second call in this parathetical set of three chapters for the endurance of the saints. And when Scripture reiterates something, not only is that point important, it is of utmost importance. And we read earlier in chapter 13, verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he must be slain or beheaded. Here's a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. And we hear, blessed are the dead who die from the Lord, in the Lord from now on. Um, as it, this was uh, pretty much uh, explained to us in the breaking of the fifth seal. The full measure of martyrs has not happened yet. Dying for the cause of Christ continues. Just a review of the fifth seal in Revelation 6 verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they were each given a white robe and they were told what? To rest a little longer. Why? Until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. Who were to be killed as they themselves have been. So this is very, very black and white. Um, the fullness of martyrs and martyrdom is, uh, is part of God's plan. But blessed are the dead who die from now on. So how do we endure? Well, Paul does a great job explaining, and that is by standing firm, standing firm on your principles, standing firm on the scripture, standing firm on who, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have said it many times, but uh, you know, the more we prepare and have mentally processed through all this and have rehearsed what we're going to say, if I'm confronted with that, my words are going to be, first and foremost, uh, the Holy Spirit will intervene and give us words. But in my, in my uh, uh, rehearsing in my mind, it's I choose to obey God rather than man. And Paul says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That's what's being explained here in Revelation. And having done all, to what? To stand firm. This is how we have victory over Satan. Satan cannot force us to turn away from Christ. And here we read that it, this endurance, it also carries a beatitude because we read, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord 
from now on. And note also that it's the Holy Spirit himself who reiterates that they will be blessed indeed for their deeds follow them. And this, by the way, is the only time the Holy Spirit is recorded speaking in Revelation. But he is affirming that nobody who dies standing firm for the Lord will die in vain. That person will be remembered. That person will be rewarded by the Lord himself after their death. Uh, we read in Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Okay, let's read on. Verse 14, Then I, John, looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So that should leave us with no doubt who this is. This is the cloud rider. This is the son of one like the son of man. This is also quoted in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. This is Jesus now seated on the white cloud. This is also the, the cloud rider as prophesied in Daniel 7, where we read in Daniel 7, 13. Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, to Yahweh, and was presented before him. And to him was what? Given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is, not, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And what's God doing or Jesus doing here now? He's harvesting in his kingdom. He has a sharp sickle in his hand. It's time for the harvest. In Jesus' own words, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in this harvest. He says also in John 4, uh, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. Okay, so that would have been the harvest of those that are now in rest. The, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. But here's the saying holds true. When souls another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Verse 15 now, John sees another angel who came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So evidently Yahweh has given the word, go ahead. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. And compare this to what he, Jesus said in Mark chapter four, where he says the kingdom of God. Now what's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the kingdom of end times. The kingdom of God is the kingdom that is without evil that is full of what redeemed bodies. Uh, so those who enter into the kingdom of God here are those in the end of age. It's as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, when the crop is ready to be harvested, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Um, and it says, so he who sat in the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. We could also compare what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, that he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. That will be the rapture and the resurrection. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. Okay, so we got this harvest. 
Now John looks and there's another angel that came out of heaven, of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Now wait a minute, we just had a harvest. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. Now is this just a fire of the altar or is this also authority over the lake of fire? We, we're not, we don't know for sure. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. Now remember, we've already had one harvest. For its scrapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bride for 1600 stadia. Wow. What we have going on here? Well, we got another angel, another mission. And, and as this angel uh, has authority over fire, we question which fire, uh, the fire before the altar or the lake of fire. Uh, but what we do know beyond a shadow of a doubt is that this angel is harvesting for the wrath of God. Um, compare this to what uh, Revelation chapter 20 records. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name not found in, written in, on the book of life or in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of of fire. Compare this also to a very powerful prophecy in Isaiah. Very powerful. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, this is the Lord speaking, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? Well, we will read in Revelation 19 that the, when uh, the lamb is charging with his army, what? He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. So why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have treaded in the winepress alone and from the peoples. No one was with me. I tried them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. This is Revelation 19. I looked but there was no one to help. I was Paul, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. As captured by John for 1600 stadia, as high as a horse's bridle. So that's Revelation chapter 14. So to summarize all this, chapter 14 appears to be an interlude. It's giving further clarification on what has happened, on what is ongoing, and what is yet to come. And therefore, it's better just to sit back and understand the message and its application. That's what's important, rather than try to place these events on, that, on a specific chart uh, a specific timeline. Now, as for the 144,000 in chapter 7, uh, we read where the 144,000 Jews were mere, merely had, what, the seal of the living God on their foreheads in order to protect them from the trumpet judgments. Now, in chapter 14, the 144,000, they're refined. They've been redeemed by God, and they're labeled as first fruits, which means that there is more for the harvest. Now, okay, now we see three particular angels. The first angel is ensuring that the gospel is proclaimed to throughout the earth. Okay, this is the heart of God as reported by the apostle Peter, 2 Peter 3, 9. 
where he says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And then we got a second angel that announced what? Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which we will read about. But in this parathetic, this parathetical event, it has not happened yet. And we'll start in chapter 16. And then we got this third angel uh, that announced a very stern warning that anyone who worships the beast in its image and receives the mark of his forehead or, or on, his, on his hand will drink what? the wine of God's wrath, and will be tormented forever and ever. So what we have here in Revelation 14 also was a very important what? Call for endurance of the saints, okay? In this section of history, the saints are still there. They have not been raptured out yet. There is a blessing pronounced from heaven for those who endure, and this is reiterated by the Holy Spirit himself. For everyone who keeps the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Then we see that Jesus, the Son of Man, he initiates the harvest of the earth. Uh, we see two other angels, one who's in charge of fire. They'll initiate a grape harvest of the earth. And he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So that takes us to chapter 15. And here we see God's final wrath where it, the, it begins. So let's go there real quick. First one. Then I saw another sign. That's an important word in heaven. Great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. And for with them, the wrath of God is finished. Interesting how John uses the word plagues. Where have we read that before? Oh, yes, in Exodus. Um, in the, in the, uh, the rescue of God's people from Pharaoh in Egypt. But nevertheless, what God, John sees here is what? Another sign, Simeon, which is a sign, a wonder, a remarkable event, a wonderful appearance, an extraordinary phenomena. So this likely means that what John, what's going to follow is symbolic. It's symbolism, but it's great and amazing. And it's a little different uh, from what we, lots of times we use those words in today's context. But this is John's description of the sign. Great. Why? Because it, this is, was to complete God's wrath. That is great, which are the last and we will hear is finished. And that means God's coming kingdom is now intimate. And that is great. Amazing. Thaumastos, meaning that it's beyond human comprehension. Utterly, utterly amazing. Verse 2, And what I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. They're standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So those who have conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, this appear, it appears that everyone who has endured the great tribulation are, are now in front of the throne. So those that had faced the, the wrath of Satan uh, that he had against the saints, they're now in heaven at the sea of glass that's before the throne, worshiping God. And this most likely includes the 144,000 firstfruits as well as the remaining Jews who have accepted Yeshua as their Messiah. Verse 3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Okay, first and foremost, 
The song of Moses was not sung to Moses. It was sung by Moses. It was led by Moses, and it celebrated the victory of the Lord in defeat of um, his of defeat of the end of the Egyptians and at the Red Sea and his uh, victory was obviously their victory so if the same sentence structure applies then the song of the lamb is not being sung to the lamb but it is sung and led by the lamb Jesus Christ Yeshua and in that case, the song is sung to God the Father, Yahweh. However, keep in mind also, this is a parathetical chapter. So it's most likely this song has not happened yet in the storyline, in the timeline. But it will most likely be sung after the seven bowls and after the battle of Armageddon, just like the song of Moses after the children of Israel had been fully rescued and Pharaoh and his army had been destroyed. And this compares with a prophecy given by the prophet Zephaniah, where he says, they will do no wrong, they will tell no lies. Well, we've already read a little bit about the, this being the, uh, the outcome of the refinement of the 144,000. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord Yahweh has taken away your punishment. That's the new covenant. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord Yahweh, the king of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord Yahweh, your God, is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will what? He will rejoice over you with singing. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home to Mount Zion. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says Yahweh. This also compares with uh, some more prophecies by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, 7. Who should not fear you, king of the nations? Which we're reading here. Um, o king of the nations in Revelation. This is your due. All among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. Malachi prophesied that my name, that being the name of the Lord, will be what? Great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets in every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says Yahweh Almighty. It's also prophesied in Psalms 86, 9, all the nations you have made will come and worship before you. And we read about that in Zechariah chapter 14. Lord, they will bring glory to your name, for you are great, and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. And then we read in verse 5, after this, I looked, in the sanctuary of the tent of of witness in heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. It's kind of um, ironic that for such a massive, catastrophic, bloody event, they're clothed in pure, white, bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. 
So once again, we got a very formal ceremony, and this time to disseminate the final seven judgments of God's wrath against the Antichrist and unrepentant mankind. And these seven gold bowls, the Greek word here for bowls is the same as the, the bowls that were used in Revelation 5.8. However, these bowls were full of incense, which were the prayer of the saints, which tells us once again uh, the, the important role of prayer by the saints. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God, that being the Shekinah glory, uh, that the way it's explained in Hebrew. Uh, compare this to Isaiah 6, 4, where it says the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Second Chronicles 7, 2 recorded that the priest could not enter the house of Yahweh because the glory of Yahweh filled Yahweh's house. So, that ends chapter 15. And now we start chapter 16, and we'll read verse 1, where it says, I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And that's where we will pick up next time. So amen and amen, this is heavy, heavy happenings in the um, in the, the events as recorded in Revelation. And it just it just goes to show us how sovereign God is and how he is holy and how in the end um, everything wrong will be made right. So thank you, Almighty God, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.